Okay, so um, today's lecture is microdosing mindfully. Um, the reason for this is because I was kind of watching the market trends where we start seeing a lot of people talking about microdosing, but there are certain nuances that I wanted to share um, with everyone that I've come across in the last couple of years. And I'm very grateful for Silo Health for providing this platform for me to be able to do this. So a brief history about me. Um, I was in my pediatric residency in Harlem, New York until about two years ago. At the end of my second year, I realized that I was not buying what I'm selling. Uh, I did not believe that our healthcare system was using all the tools available to us to help our patients. So I resigned to pursue alternative healing paths. Essentially, I left medicine to pursue a life of healing. And for the first time in my medical career, I had time to explore those topics outside of the curriculum that, you know, that I was used to, which included mindfulness-based stress reduction, Ayurvedic medicine, plant medicines like uh, cannabis. And when I discovered the unbelievable healing potential of psychedelics, I decided to commit the next two years to learning as much as I can on the topic so as to help integrate these practices into mainstream medicine. Along my journey, I've had the privilege of hearing about the experiences of dozens of people who have been experimenting with psilocybin. And I would like to thank each and every one of them because it was their insights that allowed me to cultivate a deeper understanding of the nuances of microdosing that is often missed by mainstream media, at least for now. So as a disclaimer, um, you know, we do not condone the use of illegal substances and psilocybin and psilocin is still illegal in most places. And we are aware that people are choosing to explore these modalities on their own. So I took the Hippocratic Oath when I started medical school, which states that, you know, I promise to do no harm. And after seeing the downside of microdosing, I felt a moral obligation to share what I know in order to help people avoid unnecessary suffering um, as they're exploring a healing modality. So uh, here are the objectives. Um, I'm gonna start off with the history of psilocybin just from the legal standpoint uh, in the United States particularly. And I'm gonna add in an overview of serotonin because I think it's very important for us to understand how um, you know, the past kind of plays a role in this potential future of this new emerging field. So as part of that, also the psilocybin overview and, uh, you know, discussion on how to microdose mindfully. Uh, one of the most important concepts we often hear discussed is the importance of set, setting, and dose. And however, many people focus on these factors in the setting of the higher doses, uh, the heroic doses, or in the setting of therapy. But these also key are, play key roles in the outcomes of a microdosing regimen. And when I use the term mindfully here, I really mean with intention. And the best way to set a good intention, I believe, is to know what you're getting into and why you're getting into it. Uh, for me, the best way has been to learn about the science behind it. And I hope by sharing this with you today, I can offer a broad enough foundation that anyone who chooses to explore their own psyche using psilocybin can do so with confidence. So um, I'll start with a brief history in the States because this is what led me to choose to step back into the world of medicine, albeit from a different angle, and take this path, uh, path of advocacy through education. Um, I think it's important that we don't repeat the same mistakes of the 60s where the counterculture use of these substances contributed to the change in policy that halted research. If we can inform the public on the best practices, we may be able to avoid potentially the bad publicity that can delay the progress of this re-emerging field of medicine. And most importantly, like I said earlier, we can help people avoid unnecessary suffering on their journey of self-discovery and healing. So, you know, this just goes over in the 50s and it was first discovered and brought to the Western world. In the 60s, we saw uh, a lot of research using psilocybin for mental health issues, addiction, uh, personality disorders, but the counterculture movement actually contributed to this policy reform, which made it illegal and halted research. Now, 
in the early 2000s, we saw a emergence of this research. And in 2018, the FDA granted psilocybin-assisted therapy breakthrough medication status, a breakthrough therapy designation. And this was for the treatment of treatment-resistant depression, and then in 2019 for major depression. And alongside of this, we started seeing this decriminalization movement and Colorado being the first, Denver, Colorado, being the first city to, dis to decriminalize entheogenic plants, mushrooms in particular. And with everyone following suit and research starting to pick up exponentially, um, you know, we're starting to see people having access to this medicine before they have a proper introduction to what this medicine does. And so, this is where the overview of serotonin comes into play. Um, initially, so the neurotransmitter was discovered 10 years after LSD in 1953. And in 35 years later, the first antidepressant focusing on serotonin levels came out. So this was Prozac. And it's a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor. So this would increase serotonin levels. Now, what happened was that in the 80s, you had people that were maxed out on their therapy modality. So they had optimized diet, their sleep was improved, they had group support, one-on-one -on -one therapy, and they still had symptoms of depression. And when they gave them this drug, the symptoms improved. So there suddenly was all this hype around SSRIs. And over time, what happened was we've strayed from these modalities that people were using to get better and a focus on the medication as the mainstay of treatment. And alongside of, you know, the medication having all this, you know, list of side effects, we also saw people aren't quite getting better. You had increased risk of suicidality requiring increased medication. Um, and the reason why this is important is because initially it was thought that this increase in serotonin improves your mood. However, over time, recent research is showing that increasing serotonin alone does not necessarily confer antidepressive effects. However, it does increase your susceptibility to your environment. And the reason for this is that serotonin is not just a happy neurotransmitter that we like come to know it as, but it's also responsible for plasticity and sensitivity to context. And here's why this is important. Consider a patient that uh, you know is sent to treatment for a month. They start their yoga daily. They have their group support. They do all of these you know um, holistic modalities, and they're also given an SSRI, which increases their susceptibility to the positive influence of these other modalities. Now, what we oftentimes see is something quite different, where you have somebody that has a has a mental breakdown, and they end up in the hospital for the weekend and they get started on an SSRI and then they get discharged home to the same exact environment that put them there in the first place without any new coping skills, without any guidance. And now the SSRI works to increase their susceptibility but to a negative environment, therefore making them more aware of those things in their environment that don't serve them, that depress them, that make them anxious and worsening their mental condition. So one of the best books that I read after resigning is The Body Keeps the Score. And it talks a lot about trauma. And here's a quote from there that says, over the past three decades, psychiatric medications have become a mainstay in our culture with dubious consequences. Consider the case of antidepressants. If they were indeed as effective as we have been led to believe, depression should by now have become a minor issue in our society. Instead, it has not made a dent in hospital admissions for depression. And why is this important? So here's just a list of some of the side effects that we see with serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, and one of the reasons for the side effects is that serotonin can, for comparison, dopamine has five receptors that it can act on. Serotonin has 16. So when you increase serotonin, you're not just affecting one part, you're affecting many at once. And what happened with um, with the SSRIs is that there was this, all this hype that this is the answer. And now that's kind of what I'm seeing happening with psilocybin. They're saying that this is the magic cure. This is the hope for all. 
And there's a lot to that, um, but here I'll talk a little bit more about why it's important that we take everything with a grain of salt. So just brief overview, psilocybin and psilocin are serotonin analogs. So psilocin is the active form of psilocybin. So psilocybin, once it comes into the body, it gets broken down and then psilocin is what attaches to uh, the serotonin receptors to you know, create the results, uh, the experience that we have. So they, psilocybin is a tryptamine psychedelic, which is similar to other classic psychedelics like LSD, DMT, mescaline. And um, both of these molecules as seen are very similar to serotonin. So it's not toxic to the receptor. Um, the body knows what to do with this afterwards. But one key difference is that it has a preferential um, bonding, binding to these 5-HT2A receptors. And these receptors are located in high concentrations in the cortex, um, particularly in the default mode network. So it's in the dendrites of the pyramidal cells within the regions of the prefrontal cortex, and they're responsible for brain development, cognitive and psychological flexibility, learning, and of particular importance to, in the context of this talk, unlearning. Um, something interesting that Robin Carhart Harris, who's a PhD um, from Imperial College London, uh, who studies psilocybin, he talks about how these 5-HT2A receptors um, seem to we have less of them with age, which mm, potentially might contribute to that rigid thinking that we often associate with, you know, getting older. You, know, you can't teach a dog new tricks kind of thought. So a little bit more on the default mode network. Um, so current research coming out of Imperial College London uses fMRI scans to show how different parts of the brain responds to the administration of psilocybin. Of particular importance are the parts of the brain collectively referred to as the default mode network. This default mode network is responsible for creating order and minimizing uncertainty. It is engaged during higher level operations such as thinking about thinking, uh, daydreaming, self-reflection, and introspection. And while it's very useful, um, what happens when this part of the brain is overactive is that the mind becomes too rigid. And this can lead to biased belief systems, which manifest as addictions, depression, anxiety, OCD, eating disorder. So Robin Carhart Harris discusses, um, you know, the effect of psilocybin. It induces a... Uh, what he refers to in his rebus model as an entropic hot state. Now entropy is a state of disorder, which may seem like a problem, but here the state serves to relax a person's rigid belief systems. It's essentially an opportunity to recalibrate these rigid beliefs and that lead a person to develop their maladaptive behaviors such as addiction or maladaptive thinking patterns such as depression. And this moment of uh, kind of you know, lowering the brain's control over what you're aware of and, you know, your experience of, um, of life, uh, this is a pivotal mental state. And if people are not ready for what comes up in this sensitive state, then they risk having a worsening of symptoms rather than, you know, in the therapeutic setting where this point can be the first step to somebody's, you know, wellness, uh, state of well-being. So that was, you know, a brief explanation of how it works. And now what we see is, you know, the research is, not, is coming up, you know, every day there's something new, new condition that it's treating. So here's a list of potential indications. Um, and psilocybin is indicated in a number of these because, and it makes sense because if you consider the mounting evidence that stress and tension have been discovered at the core of many illnesses, it makes sense why something that helps you process stress um, would benefit all of these. And um, once again, bringing this back to what I said earlier, the SSRIs had a lot of promise, but misused and looked at as the sole answer, the magic bullet, they have gradually fallen off as, you know, this 
beacon of hope for uh, people with mental illness. And uh, Basil van der Kolk talks about this as well. He says, in many places, drugs have displaced therapy and enabled patients to suppress their problems without addressing the underlying issue. And true healing comes when you really address where that hurt is coming from. So what inspired me to really start thinking about how do I present this to people is that I started to, the more I read, the more I researched, the more the universe put into my path people who were willing to share their experiences with me. And they essentially fell into these three categories. People who've never tried a psychedelic before, but they're getting curious because they're he hearing all this hype. Uh, people who have recently had a bad trip. And then mm, the one that really resonated was people who've been microdosing on their own, and they say that it's not quite doing something for them anymore. And so when I talk to people, I would tell them, you know, the way that psilocybin works is it helps you to process trauma. And I have my own little way of uh, describing this experience. And it comes from, it started when I was in med school. You know, my dad would tell me, go to sleep at night. Night, because the little dudes in your brain have to put away all the information into filing cabinets so that you have access to them. Now, I picture those same little dudes taking inventory of your day-to-day -day life. So as you're going through your day, they're saying, okay, this is a good, bad, neutral, good, bad, neutral through, throughout your day. When you experience something traumatic, what happens is those little dudes take a screenshot of the event, they crumple it up, they throw it in the back of the brain, and they're like, we'll get back to that later. Let's just survive. And we all know that we very rarely go back to revisit our traumas. And unfortunately, each of those traumas, little by little, starts to shape our interaction with the world, with the people in our lives, and most importantly, with, with ourselves. It changes how we view ourselves. And when I tell this to people, I'll sometimes get a little bit of, uh, you know, a question like, well, I didn't have any trauma in my life. How does this apply? So there's a, a renowned uh, neurologist, traumatologist, Robert Scare, who says, who defines trauma in its simplest form as any negative experience that happens in a state of relative helplessness. So what does that mean? It means that if you're in a job that you hate, but you need it to pay rent, you're relatively helpless. If you are in a relationship and you're staying together for the kids, you are relatively helpless. And unfortunately, as a child, at baseline, you are relatively helpless, which is why something as simple as, as tripping in front of your crush in kindergarten can translate into you not going out for basketball in high school or having stage fright as an adult. And what happens with when you take a psychedelic, and this is more, um, you know, the timeline is a little bit more geared towards uh, higher doses. So initially, you take a psychedelic and the little dudes in your brain take some stimulants and they start going at these filing cabinets, refiling whatever has been misplaced. You know, so you essentially, you take out, you remember some memory from like second grade, a conversation with Johnny. And you pull it out, you're like, wait a second, this wasn't a bad experience because this was actually, it taught me this here and it taught me this here. So this gets refiled into good or neutral. And Little by little, this process, what you're essentially doing is rewriting your narrative. And this in and of itself can be very healing. Now, around hour three is when I would hear people report, you know, that they started to feel some discomfort. They would decide to smoke, to drink, have sex, eat, sleep, watch TV. Any of the vices that they're used to going to, to numb any of the uncomfortable feelings that come up. Now. The reason for this, to further this little story, is that around hour three, those little dudes are done with this front, you know, the front cabinets, and they go, oh man, what's back there? And they start pulling these traumas out one by one. Now, if you are in the right set and setting, if you know that this is a potential, um, you know, part of the experience, and you're in a safe space where you can actually go through these traumas, you unfold these pieces of paper, and you get to go through um, these life-changing experiences. Now, what's interesting is that we oftentimes remember things 
based on how they made us feel, not necessarily in the most accurate detail. And particularly when you're a child, you don't even have the words to explain what was happening. So in this moment, you have the privilege of remembering in greater detail what actually happened. And in this process, you're also removing the emotional charge from this event. And we all know that we learn more from our traumas than we do from our joys. However, think about those people that, you know, your loved ones that you see them repeating the same mistake over and over and you're like, but you know better. Like they know better, but they don't have access to that knowledge because it's crumpled up somewhere in the back with all the other pieces. So in this moment, you're accessing information that these traumas taught you. And you get to file these experiences away as, you know, in the filing cabinets, and it becomes, the trauma becomes part of your narrative rather than a defining characteristic of who you are and how you act and what you think and all of these things. So um, this is in the ideal situation. Now, a lot of people that I talked to, they were doing this with friends, they were doing this uh, recreationally or people they don't know. And what happens in those situations is that you know, you fight the, you know, the desire to process it isn't there. You fight that experience. And what ends up happening is, you know, you block one, they're like, oh, let's just grab this one. So you end up the next day with a bunch of, you know, semi-crumpled up pieces of paper stuck in a folder thrown at the top of one of the cabinets. And it's kind of like when um, you clean your apartment and you just shove everything in the closet. You know, somebody comes over and compliments your cleanliness and you get this like uncomfortable feeling because you know deep down there's still so much to go through in that closet. Now, the reason that I explain this, um, you know, this is more for the higher dose. However, similar things can happen with a microdosing regimen. And essentially, microdosing will feel good and it will have these positive effects for a person, as long as the person is mostly focusing on clearing out those front cabinets. And depending on who you are, you may have a lot of misfiling um, that needs to be addressed. So it may take a couple of weeks for you to see this, you know, the uh, downside of microdosing. Now, the negative of side effects could be as subtle as starting to snack. Sorry about that. Um, to snack when you're not hungry, or it could be more pronounced, like a worsening of your anxiety or your depression. So the very things that people are actually coming to these medicines to try to overcome. And this is why it's important to microdose mindfully, because while a bad trip can be quite transformative with the right sitter during an inter or you know, sitter during or an integrative process afterwards. People who are microdosing rarely have someone that, with them during, and they rarely plan or even know to plan for the days following the dose. So this is why I'm giving this lecture, because like imagine how frustrating it is to hear about this, all this new hype, uh, this magic bullet that's gonna help your symptoms and temporarily does, um, and then all of a sudden your symptoms come back and it's not working anymore. How disheartening is that for somebody who's already struggled with mental illness for most of their life? So um, I looked into a lot of uh, you know, the recommendations that are out there for microdosing. And one of the things that I came across that was interesting was, you know, you have the Fadiman protocol that suggests one dose every three days, uh, the Stamets protocol of three days on, four days off, and there's varying you know, recommendations of three weeks to six weeks and then taking a break. Now, many underground companies also, the ones that provide the products, they've come up with their protocols and I invite people to ask them, you know, ask themselves, what is their true intention when it comes to this? Because while I agree that it's, you know, psilocybin microdosing is superior to the traditional SSRIs, what I hope to avoid is having people depending on another substance for their well-being, rather than using it as the crutch that it is for their healing journey. It's kind of like when you break your ankle, you know, when you put a cast on, 
you use your crutches while you're learning to walk again normally you know the goal isn't to have crutches for life and that's what i see the true uh difference between ssris and psilocybin is it it makes the whole process of you know whether it be in therapy or just you know other modalities it makes the process quicker because it gives you that activation energy that push to get done those things that you uh want to get done to live a better life you know we all know what we need to do is just we sometimes have a hard time doing it so market research that i did revealed that many companies recommend like a 0.2 to 0.3 gram dose and they say it's a good dose however i postulate that that dose may set up a person for potentially experiencing something called spiritual bypassing and this is a tendency to use spiritual ideas and practices to sidestep or avoid unresolved emotional issues psychological wounds and unfinished developmental tasks I'll give an example of what this looks like in you know day-to-day -day life so imagine a person wants to start this because they sense that they are you know fighting too much with their significant other um, they're frustrated at work and they just kind of want to get better now 0.25 of a gram may very well um, you know leave this person with you know, positive effects they will see the beautiful soul that sits inside of their significant other and they will love them now unfortunately if you take a slightly lower dose that just increases your susceptibility to your environment then you may that same person may actually realize that they're in a toxic codependent relationship now what you know so uh, for some people, the more important question when it comes to microdosing is if they're ready to see what it is in their life that needs changing. Now, some people, you know, something for work, you know, if people are using this to be more productive, more creative in a job they love, that's great. And even in a job that they don't love, they'll be more creative and their performance might improve. However, if you take a lower dose, you may become more aware of the fact that you don't like your job. And now what? You know, so this can cause anxiety, this can cause worsening depression. And if you don't know that this may be happening, if you don't take this opportunity, you know, when you feel anxiety on a lower dose, you can look at that as an unfortunate side effect, or you can see that as an opportunity to look around yourself and ask, what is causing me this feeling right now? Because that may be that part of your life that is asking to be changed. So, Unfortunately, um, right now there's not a lot of research and that's really what we need in order to progress further. And as unbelievable as these high dose uh, experiments have been, I think microdosing is gonna be a much more common um, use of these plant medicines, at least in the beginning while you know, all of this um, information is kind of coming out and it's accessible to people. So at the end of the day, particularly when it comes to trauma, people who have trauma, and uh, this was from the book Consciousness Medicine um, by Francois Berzat. It should be noted that people with unresolved traumas should seek a well-trained practitioner for intentional exploration of consciousness with psychedelics or other powerful modalities. The connection with a trained guide can help mitigate the potential overwhelm that people with unresolved traumas are at a higher risk of encountering. Uh, again, with this unnecessary suffering, the high doses can sometimes unlock things people aren't ready to unlock. The lower doses may invite them to peek into that back room and then they can actually go to therapy and uh, be able to process whatever comes up on their own, you know? So it's important to have somebody there. But general guidelines, um, start low and go slow. There's a lot of variability between uh, even within the same uh, batch or like within the same species there's variability in how much active ingredient the psilocybin is in the mushroom so something like 0 0.05 of a gram can feel like 0 0.2 depending on where you get it from where it's sourced how it's you know so that's something to keep an eye out for another thing is each person responds differently because each person has a unique internal terrain and external environment and we very rarely know uh, the details of a person's experience so it's important that the person knows their own limits 
Have an intention when you dose, uh, regardless of how small, and a plan for integration for whatever comes up. Now, what I mean by this is set your intention for why you're doing this, and then make sure you have a plan of what to do with information that comes up, because there was a TED talk that I watched where the woman said, clarity comes from engagement, not from thought. And this was one of the nuances that I noticed with uh, people microdosing. When even a day after uh, an experience, for the next two days even, you may experience vibrating at a higher frequency. Now, in clinical terms, that can be referred to as hypomanic. So in these moments, you have an a choice to make you know are you gonna take action on those things that you realize that you want to change in your life whether it be starting to journal learning to cook um, exercise practice whatever it is or are you gonna choose to not do anything with it now in the latter you run the risk of this increased energy this hypomanic state to revert you right back to those repetitive toxic thoughts that you're trying to get away from in the first place. And once again, clarity comes from engagement. So when you harness that increased energy, that's where the real change happens. And there's not a lot of research out there, but the most, the best thing you can do for yourself is get informed. So um, the research will come and it will um, address those populations that right now aren't eligible. You know, right now we have, uh, since research is geared for uh, bringing this medicine to mainstream, they avoid confounding variables. So certain vulnerable patient populations like those with schizophrenia, psychosis, bipolar disorder, uh, recent suicide attempts, borderline personality disorder, currently on antidepressants, all these patients who could benefit so much um, aren't eligible right now. But a lot of them will start to explore these on their own. And I just hope that uh, we can offer some guidance for these people who choose not to wait for the research to mount. Now, this, like one of the issues about not having so much research is the safety data. So right now, there's a recent article from Chakuna Institute, Why Chronic Microdosing Could Break Your Heart, that talks about uh, potential long-term side effects uh, from microdosing. And I'm excited for the microdosing webinar on July 26th, where Dr. Fadiman is going to uh, discuss, you know, the, what we know up to now. So get informed. That's one of the most important things. And then uh, one of the things, you know, we have um, another quote from Francois Bazart is, whether we're able to maintain a fairly stable life or whether our suffering is such that it warrants a specific diagnosis, everyone has the capacity for emotional healing and psychological growth with the right support and conditions. So as part of the right support, um, it's making sure that people have a trusted source to go to when experiencing difficulty integrating. Um, I realize the first step is destigmatization, which I believe will happen through education and organizations such as Decrim Nature, uh, Mr. Psychedelic Law locally here in Florida, pushing for legislative changes. Now, with the stigmatization comes a need for quality information to reach the mainstream, because I want this information to get to people before they get to the medicine, so that they don't, again, have that unnecessary suffering. And this means that we got to get good and bad information out there. And we want therapists to know both sides and be aware of the nuances of these experiences. Because as of now, if you experience uh, any kind of psychiatric uh, consequences from your microdosing regimen, if you seek traditional help, you may end up in a loop of medications and suboptimal therapies again. Uh, we need more education and more research in order to start normalizing the use of these medicines for self-exploration and healing. Um, so that's... Uh, that's that's it for me. Awesome, Doc. Thanks for thanks for that really insightful presentation on microdosing and uh, overview of psilocybin uh, its history. So it was, uh, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I do have a couple questions that were sent to me. Uh, I will take this time now to um, unmute the attendees since we have uh, about 
about 11 of us on, on the call. And I'll open the floor up to any questions uh, that anyone may, might have before I get to any of the questions that were sent to me. So uh, please feel free to unmute yourselves if you have any questions at all. And uh, yeah, I'll, Julia will be able to answer. I'll be helping answer any questions that we can, we can try to tackle together. And we also have, I believe, Scott on uh, the panel here as well. All right, I'm gonna, I'll start if, if that's okay. Um, sure. I do have a question about, um, and I can't remember exactly how it was phrased, but it was kind of like the spiritual bypassing on the microdosing. Um, I guess, where does that boundary lie? Because as far as personal responsibility in taking a psychedelic, um, you know, we can, it's kind of like you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink kind of a thing. And ultimately, I think an individual's choice as to whether or not to stay in whatever the situation is, whether that be a job or a relationship or a friendship, ultimately comes that individual's choice. So I don't know. I think it's, I think it's a fine line to walk to to call something spiritual bypassing as an outside observer um i mean because obviously like we can see it from an outside perspective and we can like, quote unquote judge that but the person that's in it has a completely different mindset so i guess kind of where's that where's that line or how do you differentiate from a therapist's point of view as far as just giving them the tools and then if they use the tools great and if they don't they don't my yeah is there more no i was just going to say what are your thoughts on that so the reason why i bring this up the spiritual bypassing part um is really for people to not get discouraged um by their experience you know if they they may end up staying but if they're staying and they're kind of like i want people to be aware of the spectrum of experiences they can have and allow them to make a conscious choice like so if they have um because you said the part like about judging like where where they're at it it's just to give that like uh devil's advocate to what the what is going on sorry um is spiritual bypassing a, a word you wouldn't use it's, i guess the question is more along the lines of how do you as a user and a a person that is helping a client um try uh, tr uh, travel or navigate uh, microdosing, how do you balance between whether or not a person is doing this, you know, mindfully versus spiritual bypassing? Like, is there any way of differentiating between the two? Because, you know, when it comes to microdose, you know, especially with high variability across different, uh, different strains or sources of these compounds, you know, how can we ensure that, you know, spiritual bypassing doesn't occur? Is that, did I phrase that correctly, Amy? Is that more or less what you're asking? More or less, but also, also too, as as far as, um, okay, say, for example, like, I guess the way that I, I compartmentalize, the way that I process that information is that if I have a client who is in a toxic relationship, um, from my perspective, clearly I can see it's a toxic relationship, and clearly I can see because of their mental model of what they think love is, they're essentially just repeating a pattern because their parents taught them that that's what love was. Um, I can give that client, you know, those tools and that information and just a different perspective, but whether or not that client chooses to say, oh my gosh, you're right, I was repeating a pattern, let me switch that, or oh my gosh, you're right, I was repeating a pattern, but I'm okay with it. Like, oh. I, like how do you... Like what I guess like spiritual bypassing is kind of like I feel like it's kind of judging someone like it ultimately it's their choice to do what they want to do 
so in its definition, the spiritual bypassing talks about like, you know, the way that I look at it is those people who start microdosing and then they start to get uncomfortable or they're not quite getting those same results and they try to go up on their dose, you know, to kind of get more of a positive feeling. Now, eventually they're not going to have that positive feeling. And I think that's why we don't see this as an addict, like, um, on a use wise, like you don't see it being too addictive because at one point, no matter how high a dose you're going to take it, they're, they're just going to show you where you haven't healed yet. So spiritual bypassing to me is, you know, if they are in both of those scenarios that you said, the person gained awareness of what's going on. So after that, it's a choice of like what they choose to do with that information. The spiritual bypassing part is, um, not even getting to that point and this is more for people um doing this on their own you know with therapy it's a completely uh it's a completely different ball game i would imagine i see i i understand where you're coming from now i think i just needed that clarity yeah thank you no and i'll i'll make sure to thank you for that also because i'll make sure to go into that in a little bit more detail and with a little bit more clarity next time that was an awesome question. That was an awesome question. <laughs> and my favorite term too. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions uh, before I hop on to the written questions we have out? Okay, and uh, question, one question here, or uh, yeah, one question here from Bill uh, in the Zoom is, just to, clar to clarify what you mean on uh, the definition of microdosing, uh, he says, I assume your definition of microdosing is enough dose to move a person up to a higher level of insight or energy, openness, euthemia, uh, which is defined as a loosening up of a personality with a sense of safety, but uh, not enough for the user to experience a psychedelic sensation. Uh, I said, I replied, yes, subperceptual dose, typically one tenth to one twentieth of a standard trip dose or threshold breaking dose. Uh, did you want to did you want to add anything to that definition of a microdose, Julie? Yeah. So what's interesting is, you know, we talk about the different um, strengths depending on where you're getting it from. And I have seen people experience profound um, effects from even something as small as 0.05 of a gram. And Robin Carhart Harris talks about the 5-HT2A receptors and the fact that they get upregulated, so they become more available and more active when in response to stress so for people who have chronic stress they have an increased number of these receptors so i think for like those who have stress they can feel they have more receptors to be activated so they could feel a lower dose um you know i've had pe the same like people take the same stuff and one feels it one way one feels it a different way so when people talk about sub perceptual um I kind of think twice because it's it's so different for so many people. I look at the microdose as um, I there's some leeway with perceptual uh, experience of it. The real goal is for I mean I think that point one can do a lot for people if they are consciously aware of their experience. But to get to that point, sometimes it takes some effort. You know, there, in um, James Fadiman's book, he talks about how, like, you, I, th I think that's where it was, where you have to give yourself enough, um, like, quiet around the experience to be able to perceive the dose. So I think also, like, in the setting that you're taking it. So if you're constantly distracted by a lot of different things, you may not be able to feel the dose as much as you do if you're sitting at home meditating. Thank you for that. Um, so two questions I have for you, Doc. One is, what are your thoughts on the notion held by some medical professionals that microdosing is indeed or actually a placebo effect? What are your, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? So I recently asked that question at the Horizons conference, uh, mm -hmm. and the, the person also said, you know, it's probably placebo, but like I said, I've seen people feel much smaller doses. So 
at least from my experience, I see that, you know, there's something to, to that. And the other thing is, so what? If placebo effect is our ability to take control of, you know, our minds of our behavior, you know, because this is really what it is. It's being more aware of your self. Um, so what? You know, so I remember in medical school, placebo effect was one bullet point on a biochemist, like on an 80 lecture, like 80 slide lecture of biochemistry in semester one. And we never talked about it again, really, unless it was in the context of it's unethical to study the placebo effect in certain situations. Mm -hmm. But with all of this new, um, you know, epigenetics and all of these things happening, we need to reconsider our feelings towards the placebo effect. Totally. Yeah. I mean, yeah, if you look at just uh, genetically, everyone have varying levels of uh, receptors for, for serotonin occupancy. That's one thing to take in consideration. But then secondly, you mentioned epigenetics. And I know Amy is a nerd on epigenetics, so she could probably get into a little bit more of that. But there's so much, there's so much research there as well. So when you're talking about there being, you know, proven efficacy regarding a high dose, macro dose psilocybin experience, it just makes you wonder, like, how can a micro dose be placebo? And I guess it depends on what you're studying or what you're what you're investigating in uh, in like an arm uh, for a placebo versus you know micro dose uh, uh, trial like head to head. But like, if you're talking about even smaller doses, you know, m minuscule doses being digested, broken down, and then then occupying receptors associated within the default mode network and that pre uh, that that higher cortex that you're speaking about, then I mean I really feel as though it's hard to argue that it is the placebo effect. But you know, that's why we need more research. We need more research, we need more education, we need more awareness, we need conversation about this. And uh because that's so that's so important. So yeah, it's an, it's an interesting conversation. That was a great question that asked by uh, that was asked by uh, David. He actually, I think he's hopped off. So I'll, uh, I'll this is recorded. So we'll go ahead and forward that to him. Uh, a second question we have, Julia, is: Do you know of or expect any potential medical or therapeutic benefit from a specific combination of macro and micro doses? For example, one macro dose followed by biweekly micro doses for two months or maybe multiple microdoses leading up to a macrodose? So this is my personal opinion. I think um, the microdose before a macrodose is very important. And this is because so many of us go through life with repressed traumas that we've forgotten that they're there. And if you're not ready, like you may not even know if you're ready to process that until you're in the midst of a high dose and you're experiencing, you know, reliving a childhood trauma. That is so, that in, that in and of itself is another, you know, it's another trauma that you can have post-traumatic stress disorder after. So with a microdose, what's really cool is that when you ask a person their story on a microdose and they start sharing, you you can notice a person start telling a story and then say, wait a second, is that a pattern of mine? Or they'll remember, oh, wow, I just remembered this thing. I forgot that this even happened. And what I picture happening you know, with my little story is the microdose lets you peek into that back room and be like, oh, there's some stuff there. And then it's a choice of when you're going to go into this high dose to process that. Are you going to choose to do this in a therapeutic setting? You know, because it can be very intense to go in blind. And a lot of professionals that I've met, you know, for them, there's also this misperception that a high dose is going to change how they think. And they're like, I like my life how it is. I don't want to change it. And the microdose allows them to kind of dip their foot in and develop a relationship with this plant medicine so that it serves them rather than traumatizes them. Well said. Cool. Yeah, that was, those are all the questions we have. Um, I'll open the floor up one more time for anyone else, any of the attendees that have any final questions at all. Okay, cool. Well, uh, 
Nope, I think Shannon unmuted. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly, not really a question, but a comment. Um, I'm, I really enjoyed your, your lecture. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sneaking back into psychedelics after about a 20 year break. So it's really interesting to um, get a much more educated look into it this time versus the good old college days. So um, I'm excited and uh, looking forward to all that I learned. So thank you. Cool, thank you. Thanks, Shannon. Thank you. Cool. All right, guys, uh, thank you so much for attending. This was our second uh, webinar we posted. We're hoping to continue to have these on a monthly basis. And um, yeah, stay tuned for, for more awesome information. Thank you so much, guys. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.